said you worked a lot with Terrence. What is your, I mean, he's the director, you're the director of photography. Can you say a little bit about what your relationship is, especially with somebody that you've worked with so much? I imagine that the two of you, not only do you know each other's styles, but you've kind of developed a style together, I would imagine, by now. Yeah, yeah. Um, how much of that is you? How much of that is him? Well, it's, fun, it's funny because it's a, it's very <coughs> symbiotic. You know, I've worked with a few other directors now, thank God, and it's not, some of it's been very good and some of it's been very bad. Mm -hmm. And um, with Terrence, Terrence is so, we're sort of, we're sort of users for each other. I have a lot, of, the look is really, I have a lot to do with the look of the film. You know, Terrence trusts me with that. Um, he'll usually give me first, first frame. You know, and then it'll be like, okay, let's tweak it a little bit here and there if you want. If you, if you, and I have a lot, if I say Terrence, if I pull him to the sides and come and look at this, you know, he'll trust me. I'm not sure how much of my work you've seen, but. I don't know, but have you seen the Fresnel Mirrors piece with the hat maker? Yes, I have. There's a scene where um, in that film, the, the camera goes out the door and you start seeing these dancers. Mm -hmm. But I completely created that. Like for instance, that scene was supposed to take place, take place in the park. Yeah. And I was like, and I walked out, the door, we first got that location, that door was closed. So we never saw it. So I'm like there on the day of and the door's open. I walked out, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, T, come here. I was like, look at this. You know, the color palette, everything worked, bang. You know, so sometimes you get those happy moments where, you know, we scout everything. Terrence and I scout everything together. We go over color palettes together, costume. So everything is designed uh, between the two of us. It's not, I mean, he's, he's the, definitely the leader. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely the support to his vision, 100%. It's not my vision. Mm -hmm. But it's, a, it's very much a muse, muse. He, I'm gonna use my muse on this one. And how is it different when you're working with other directors that you're not as familiar with, or? Well, I've learned some valuable lessons in that department. Uh -huh. Because I just got finished with a feature where it was terrible. Mm. And um, mainly because the director wasn't visual and wasn't sure. Okay. Uh, and, um, so what does that mean for you? This means I'm frustrated. It means that I'm doing a lot of two shots. And he's not brave, you know, and um, won't let me free. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to get out the cage, and he's like, this, can you just be me, Devin? I'm like, okay, I'm, no, I just want to go home. <laughs> you know, because I'm not, you know, when you see it, it's not going to be me. Yeah. It's going to be some caged, scared, and that's not my photography, you know, so. But how does that work for you? I mean, at this point, mm -hmm. you have a bit of a reputation that you, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it your livelihood depends on having some body of work that speaks to you know who you are and what you do. So I mean, how does that work when you're working with a director who your vision doesn't work together? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. At the end of the day, it's just, um, and it's funny because all during pre-production, it was like, just do what you want to do. <laughs> you know, I trust you. I love your work. Okay. Just do what you want to do. And you get there, it's like, <laughs> like locks on my shackles on my legs. <laughs> you keep like, doing what you want to do. <laughs> you, know, like, oh, oh, <laughs> you know, so I mean, people get scared. He was a new yeah. filmmaker. You know, he was a kid who, you know, he was a producer of big movies, and he never did a film before. He never shot a frame. I did a music video, and he's getting this three million dollar budget to do a movie. Yes. Yeah. You know, first movie out. That's that's white privilege. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we just keep it cool. Yeah. You know, so he was able to get that privilege, and he just he just kind of got scared. I mean, whatever. I mean, he's a nice guy. I just wasn't didn't work for me. You know, but to answer your question, my my the 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 um, lesson I learned is to be much more choosy. Mm -hmm. You know, so now I have an agent, so my agent sent me screenplays. Like my for instance, I chose that project because my agent sent me three films to read. That one was the, the one that emotionally, I was like, this is dope. It's well written, it's beautiful. The other three played, one was called Pim. It, 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 that got made, by the way. Okay. So that's coming out, you know. Now the first frame, the first description of the film, the screenplay was, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but this is true. <laughs> the first description of the movie is, camera follows a cockroach through a Bronx tenement as it crawls over a pair of gators, and I was like, <laughs> first, I was like, I need to be past that. Let's tell my agent no. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's based on that's that's monster. Oh. 
Yeah. That's being made too. Yeah. Terrence is supposed to do that, but I'm gonna show yeah. if it's done yet. Now it's monster. That's I want to do that. Yeah. I love that now, but I didn't. I don't know what happened with that. Um, but um, now pimp is based on a, a true story about a female pimp from Atlanta. Huh. I just didn't. I was like, I'm not following a road to the camera. I'm not doing it. <laughs> 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 and it's a young white, you know, young white lady. And that's fine. Uh -huh. I'm not even mad at that. But okay. don't, I just think I was like, first of all, niggas in the Bronx don't even win games. I was like, yeah, you don't even, you don't even got it right. You don't know, get it. You don't do it. Get it right. You know. So, <laughs> you know? so well, how does that work? As far as I mean, as the director of photography, in many ways, you you lead the crew. I yeah. mean, you you set. I mean, of course, the director does as well. But you set the tone in large part for the crew and kind of the tempo and the speed that you're going to work at and whatnot. Um, how how do you get good at that? And how do you get and how are you able to balance with what the director does as well? Well, I've had, it's experience, but I've had some, some good and bad times with that too. He had never directed a frame of film before in his life. Mm -hmm. He was a producer who got access to this money, he had a phenomenal screen, wrote the screenplay, a phenomenal screenplay, but he had never directed. So he was leaning on me pretty much to ghost direct his film, right? And then when he got on set, he let the AD ghost direct his film. So all the shit that we were, Talking about all this, fed, all this shots that I came up with, all of a sudden the AD was making doing coverage. You know what I'm saying? So I'm getting the most conservative coverage just to get the day, the day done, and I got muted. And I, and this is the first week, so I'm like quiet. You know, that's how my, that's my style as a person. And the AD just kind of ran over him, so it just became a, a coverage movie, as opposed to a fantastic. We had a couple of shots in there that's on my reel. That'll be on my reel when you see them. I'm like super proud of those shots. There's a couple of. <laughs> Gags and light. We came with all these fantastic light gags. You know, I'll tell you about one of them. One of them, it's a musical too. So one of them was. Um, so we had. I had the set. The set was. And his mom, the director's mom, had a church. The movie was called Saturday Church. But his mom had a church, and in the basement is like uh, fluorescent lights like this, right? There weren't no hung ceilings, but it was like this fluorescent fixtures on the this church. Beautiful floor, crazy but ugly, crazy ugly. So I had the. The gaffers um, replace all the fluorescents with China hats. You know, so we wired, we wired the whole place. The art director bought me China hats, uh, black China hats that came down like this, and I replaced them all. And I had, um, and it was also a day for night scene. I had to light. It was daylight, but it had to be a night scene, so we had to tint all the windows. So I had everything on a demo board. So all the lights on the ceiling. All the practicals in the room, this lights on stand, you know, the, the regular stands and light. Everything in the room was on this dimmer board, right? And then I had um, sodium vapor, which is like street light color. I had that punching through the tents into the window, right? And this is all on dimmer boards. And I had this thing called a sky panel, which is a, you know, it's light that, is, it's a huge, it's a, it's, a um, it's like an airy light uh, that can do dial in colors and you can dial in white you know, daylight or, or tungsten but also you dial in green or you know, any you know you can dial in any kind of degree so so this is a scene where this this woman this trans a trans musical basically and this trans woman starts singing to this boy it's a beautiful scene and I'm pushing it on the camera right she says it's normal light you know all the lights are on the room in the background there's a hole in the room so Camera's on this dolly, pushing in super close to her face, and as she starts singing, all the lights in the room go down, um, go black. Her key light goes up, and in the background, I have all the sodium vapor just blooms out. Wow, in shot. So this guy's on gym board, it's like, and I'm on camera, and I hear the producer start clapping. <laughs> it was gorgeous, it was like a moment. That was one of the things I got off. I was like, I got off. <laughs> but other than that, everything was a two shot after that. Like, after that, it was like, two shot. And I was like, <laughs> you know, so Ray was really more just, he deferred to the AD on coverage as opposed to, you know, he, he deferred to the AD on getting coverage as opposed to, you know, making art. So, you know, I mean, listen, I'm not mad at him at all. He got his movie made. You know, and I remember him saying to me, and I, the whole time we're in pre-production, I'm like, listen, I like to play with darkness. That's what I like to do, and this is why. And he like bought into it, you know. And then on set, he's like, 
that's too dark. Every fucking scene, he was like, turn the light up a little bit. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, I'm like people, I, he's like, this room would not be that dark. I'm like, it's not dark. Like, the room, people, is the lights, rooms have shape and mood. It's nighttime. Like, if you wanted to have the fucking fluorescent lights on, then why I throw these fucking China hats up? I could just turn the light on and we could have had a lit room. If that's what you wanted, and you can't, you can't say it's beautiful and then be scared. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So if you're gonna be, you're gonna be, you're gonna be courageous and have something that you that might have a voice, or you can make your shit like a comedy, like anybody, anything else. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's a choice. You have, a director has to be brave if your DP wants to be brave, and if you're not, it's gonna be a problem. You know, it's gonna be an argument on set. And at the end of the day, how many movies are you gonna see? You know, especially if you're a young director, you know, go for that shit. You know, have a voice. Be brave. Why not? What's the worst thing that can happen? What is your experience working with the difference, if there is one, working with male directors versus female directors? I don't have a difference, really, to be honest with you. Um, I think that I'm heterosexual, but I'm biromantic. <laughs> <laughs> so I tend to be romantic with my male friends, you know? Just supportive and quiet and understanding with the female directors and with the male directors. Okay. Uh, I don't... I don't believe in that. I don't believe in gender roles like that. I may be a little more sensitive with a female, maybe just as my nature as a man, you know, growing up with a, a mother who you loved, you know. So you might just have that thing, oh, I love my mother, so I'm gonna be a little more sensitive. But I'm, oh, I'm sensitive to dudes too. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if it's different. And what about seasoned directors versus newer directors? I mean, I haven't, I'm not that experienced. You know, I haven't been like, I've worked with 10,000 directors. I've only worked with a few directors, so. My one or two times I've worked with unseasoned directors that hasn't been that great. Mm. I mean, the one time I worked with, Terrence is not a seasoned director. So I guess it depends on the break, the, how much of a voice and how, I say brave really, it's more about voice. It's really more about- oh, Like taking risks. Taking so. risks, but also like, what, yeah, what are you saying? <coughs> yeah. You know, and have a conversation with me around what, are, what you want to say. You know, my conversations are always about what the character needs to, what is the character doing in this moment? What's the emotion that you want to convey in this yeah. moment? How can I help with that, with that photographically? Yeah. Some things are more standard, but sometimes you can do something photographically that really punches home yeah. an emotion. So I try to do that. Okay. I mean, I'm a little bit of experience on that. <laughs> um, there was one more question <laughs> over here. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, Sydney, I'm a screenwriter. So I, I, I'd like to know, um, I, uh, obviously, I think when we write, we have our vision in, in mind, whether we're visual or not, and the way we want to see our story. And maybe, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but uh, we may not consider what the cinematographer or the DP might want to do or not want to do. Um, like when you had the example of, um, you saw the cockroach with glory, you're like, no way, I'm not doing that, and that immediately turned you off. So what would... Um, but some DP took that job, so... Okay. It doesn't mean that that job wouldn't get done the same way. I hear you. I hear you know what I'm saying? It's not like your, your screen like won't get done. Right, right. But what do you think, I guess, in a very basic way, should screenwriters be considering? You know, not necessarily won't dictate the script necessarily, but consi- what should we consider when it comes to a cinematographer reading our work? I would say this. My main things, I, I, I haven't read a bunch of scripts, but I've read a few now. And a lot of times, screenwriters are writing plays. They're not. They're writing dialogue. They're writing plays. It's not, it's not visual. There's no description. There's no visual description. There's no world building. There's no. I need to know what it smells like. What you know. What the colors are. What the feeling is. And I, that's that's when I race through a movie. And it's it, that's when I race through a screenplay. Usually, most of the screenplays I get, it's like, is a camera in the film for a reason? If you, you can communicate in a lot of different ways, you can write a novel, you can write a play, you can say a speech on the street. There's a lot of ways to tell a story. But if you're writing a screenplay, then know that it's a visual medium. Otherwise, it's not a screenplay. Screenplay. It's a play. Right. You know, so you have to so I think it needs to be much description and less dialogue. Could you give an example of um, because as soon as you said that, my first thought was don't want to get bogged down screenwriters into big blocks of flowering description that is like a novel. So what, what screenplays do you, would, would you, do you like as a good example of like what works as a very good visual screenplay? 
I mean, I'm not an expert, but I mean, for the screenplays I've loved, have always had, um, you know, less talking heads and much more action. So it doesn't need to be a novel in terms of visual, like every visual, but it needs to be, I need to read action. You know what I mean? I mean, unless you're writing a movie where, you're writing, unless you're um, writing 12 Angry Men, you know, we're sitting in the room having a debate, that's that, that's that kind of movie. But if it's a movie that is action-based, in some way, shape, or form, that I need to read the description of the action. You know, and, and it'd be nice for me to be able to read a description of the space in the world. Create a world for me, you know? Um, that's, that's, so that's the only thing I can say, is that the ones I've read that I've loved and I've raced through always had like a world, you know? This is where they are. This is where they, the sounds that are happening. Traffic rustling through the street. It's winter. It's three o'clock. It's three. It's three a.m. in the morning. You know, or it's three p.m. and it's, it, 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 the streets away. You know, smoke is coming from. You know, whatever. But I, I get. I can see a world. First of all, I would say, don't quit. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, don't take that job. Yeah. You wasted 10, 15 years of your life. You know, I wish I was your age and just and have, and have. I wish I was your age now. Yeah. You know. What would you do different? I wouldn't take that job. Um, I would shoot a lot of stills. You know, and I did that. But if I was you, I would get a film camera and shoot some film. You know, not like most of the celluloid, yeah. regular okay. celluloid 35 get a K, get a Pentax K1, K1000 and oh. some film and get a 50 millimeter and a 35 millimeter lens and go shoot. You know, so you can learn exposure, you know, that's real. That's And also you can learn to um, gauge exposure without seeing a model. You know, like you can, you know, you can walk into a room and know your ASA, but this is probably going to be that. F4 and you're at 800 ASA because you, you know, you, sh you don't have a, a digital readout. Yeah. You know, you, you have to guess it. You know, you have a meter, you have a little meter on the camera, but I think you get stronger um, working on cellular because you have, you have to make a choice. You know, I think if you don't stand on something, learn how to stand on something, make a choice, it's distracting. And you never get a voice. It's like, at the day, people need to look at your work and be like, I don't know what it is, it's not always the same, but there's something that's, a, there's a voice there. And that's because of choices that you make. And then go hang out with um, Holly Green <coughs> down in D.C. Oh, <laughs> go yeah. talk to Holly yeah. and watch all the films he says watch. Yeah, he's, yeah. Okay. Um, you, uh, most comedies don't, are not visually stunning. Comedy? Visually stunning, yeah. And, um, you know, I am a, uh, uh, a active filmmaker, mm -hmm. and I write a lot of comedies. Mm -hmm. And um, Eric Bronco, is, you know, that's my my guy. And we are trying to create something visually stunning yet funny at the same time. So well, my question is, in your own opinion, why do you think that somewhere the heart has been lost to the laughs? Does that make sense? Um, I don't know. I just think I don't know. I can't. I'm not a ministry dude like that. But I think that there's a comedy. There's a comedy. Like you know, that comedy has a lot of media wines, right? A lot of two shots, a lot of medium wise in comedy. It's like a rules to how comedies are made that people tend to stick to because they work, right? Um, Woody Allen didn't didn't use those rules. Look at Hannah and her sisters. It's very visual. It's Gordon Willis. I just think you just gotta make the fucking movie that you want to make, and don't worry about the rules and suffer the consequences if it don't work. <laughs> you know, yeah. you suffer. You know what I mean? But if it works, then you then you're a visionary. You know, I think at the end of the day, just go for it. Um, let's go here first and then Laura. I just wanted to comment on the fact that most visionaries want to take a chance. That's what you look the you know, you want to bring forth. Um, that is cinema charlotte I know it's sad when I was watching um, one of the first shows we just watched. I know you said you, you, the colors, how did you, is that from the laughing? Fabric on the lights, so when you had uh, from the farewell, uh, or from the last one, 
Which the one with the girl is, is that the one with the girl? Yeah, it's it's right. the one? Yes. When uh, well, with the yellow with the yellow when, it, when you had her going up the being chased and I thought the colors were was far oh, so away. that was um so the two things happened when you used the tunes. One, I think I would say eighty to ninety percent of cinematography is art direction. Right? And choices of, of location. That's just as important. If you walk into location, is not just functional in the film. If you got a bedroom and you got white walls and shit and everything's white, you're like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, you got to you got to have a color palette in mind. So those locations, we the one, the French, well, not every French person, but the crew we had on that film, we had a very, very low budget film. But the crew we had were because Marseille, as much as in Marseille, France. Because Marseille is not a big market like Paris, a lot of the pros were not working. So we had like crazy pros that would normally be working in Paris would just happen to be not working. So the, the locations guy, the art director, the makeup person, the costume, those costumes were made, custom, most of them. So, you know, Terrence and I had a color palette for each character. You know, it was that teal and that like kind of fuchsia um, was, was there. Because the film, we go back, the film, Universe Ten Long. It may not have. That's actually an older version. It's not the, it's not the final version. That's just one I have. But the film is about. It's a myth. It's based on an African. Um, I forgot which country, but it's based on an African uh, a myth about two people born. But the universe. I'm sorry. The universe splitting the same person's soul into the male and female aspects before they're born. So they're the same person, but their souls came into two different vessels, a male and a female vessel. But they're the same person. The universe made a mistake. So they're never supposed to be, because they're actually the same person. So when they met and fell in love, they were doomed. And they, were, they had to die. So when you see the mother narrating, like, it's running out of time. You know, I'm trying to get you this other man. She, the mother knows that the mutant, that what would happen. The two mothers know. So the, the movie begins with the two deaths. Right, and then it shows their love affair, and then it ends with the deaths, and then it ends with them in the bathtub, and they get up and they see themselves, reflecting themselves in the mirror. Because so Unibetalon means twins, they were twin souls, same person. So it's, it's a myth, the movie's a, the movie's a recreation of a myth. Um, so Terrence's idea was to be very clear around the feminine aspect by using cat color. So her color was, was sort of fuchsia and pinkish, and his color was like tealish blue. And so we used, we found spaces that, like if you notice, she comes off the roof of um, my mother's house and she walks into that teal, that um, fuchsia pink. You know, there's um, the green teal of the kitchen. When she walks into this, she's in the kitchen. Those things were show, like we were very clear around the color palette of this film. So it shows locations that fit the color palette. So you're seeing, the color you're seeing is just a, a clarity around what our vision was color wise. But no, nothing was random. I mean, you got lucky a couple times too, you know. Um, and then the gold thing, I just made a choice to allow the color temperature of the, the sodium vapor lights that were in the street lights. I didn't correct them in the camera. Normally you can dial down the color temperature of the camera to make the lights white. So I just let them be gold. I just let it not correct. I liked it. Sometimes it's just a taste. No, it's just like, I like that. <laughs> you, know, you don't really think about it too much other than that. I like it. You know, so I kept it. I didn't die. Just in that trip, and how did you do the, the, the person like looking at each other? That's just a, um, a visual, visual effects where you do to take a shot of the person, you take a shot of one person in the bathtub, and you take the shot of the other person in the bathtub looking through the mirror. So you have both of them in frame, and then you take a, a clean slate plate so that there's a clean plate of the bathroom with nobody in the frame. So then that the visual effects person is able to pull one out and place one into that clean frame. So you have one in and one out. So it's just a visual. So as a cinematographer, how do you reconcile the idea that, you know, you may do everything that you can do to make this film the best that it can be. And then when it comes out, it's like, oh my God, you know, you're not happy with it. You know, how do you reconcile that 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 uh, fear and also the protection of your brand and yourself against instances like that? 
the end of the day, that's the choices that we work with. I've learned a valuable lesson that from now on, I'm gonna, I'd rather suffer financially. You know, because you also, you know, if, you, if you're working, you have some agents, you can do more commercial work, you don't give a fuck about that. You know, but for your future, because I'm at the, where I'm at, the level I'm at, I'm not doing, you know, 10, uh, $15 million feature, or $50 million feature, I'm doing one, you know, one point five, two million dollar, three million dollar feature at my level. So that level, I'm not making no money anyway. You know, I might make a uh, two million dollar feature. I might make twenty grand. You know, for two months' work. You know, it's not bad in terms of I guess what people make in the world or whatever. But it's not like it's a gang of money. So you know, you might just choose for a feature. It's so much hard work for that little money. You might just choose the shit you really know is gonna work. You gotta just choose well. And then a second question that I had was about when you talk about being brave on set and really as a producer, that sounds to me as a like a function of preparation um, and spending time, a lot of time ahead of time, um, really understanding the shots that you are going after and being able to then have the time to really um, do those on set. So how do you work with um, the director in pre-production and to really prepare yourselves to be able to do stuff creatively on set. One of the things that we had against us in that last year was that we, because the, of the nature of the locations, we didn't get a chance to do a lot of shot listing on locations because they were being constructed and it was an active church. So we were shot listing in the park, you know, trying to imagine the things. Sometimes you, what happens when you get on set you see that the, the, the things that you imagine may take more time or there are physical limitations to the space. Um, so I guess the one way you, the one way you can curtail that is during pre-pro. Pre and most pre-pro for a low-budget indie film, and when I say low-budget indie film, I mean two million. But most pre-pro is like a month, right? And that's location scouting, that's shot listing, that's watching movies with the director. Pulling out, that's my job. I usually watch movies with that. I watch about five movies with this director. You know, we took stills of frames that we liked for coverage, how things were covered, and we were analyzing that. Um, then, you know, we got on set and he, did, he, he got, he got wide. I don't know that. Maybe he thought I got wide eyed. One of the two, something didn't work. But sometimes it's just, you know, you can't prepare and not, I don't know. I would go, I, you know, I would go through the process a little bit. And at the end of the day, it's the taste of the director, though. And then the day, if I set up a shot and I got the viewfinder, you know, you have a stick with the, with the lens on it that you're using, your lens, and, your and I got my lens, and I'm like, what do you think about this shot? Come over and look at it. And he's like, can you just push it a little more? And at the end of the day, if he does that, he's the director. Mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, it comes down to his taste. So you gotta be careful, you gotta know the taste. Of it. Anytime somebody comes to you and say, I haven't directed a film before, and I need to rely on you, say no. Because <laughs> they're not going to rely on you. Because human, human habit and fear comes out. You know, they got producers looking at the monitor. Yeah, the whole producer team at the monitor like this. You know, so he's like... You know what I'm saying? You know, so... You know, so you got this pressure. You know, pressure on everybody. You know, so... You know, I just say, you got to be... Right now, my thing now is that I'm going to stop... I don't want to make this sound bad. I really want to work with my family. I really want to work with black people, really. Um, to start, black people of color, really. To start and then grow in the same way kind of Brad did and grow your skill set in a more safe environment mm -hmm. and then go out to the non safe, the less safe environments. Mm -hmm. You know, because when you get people's money, they can think you're the most beautiful cinematographer on the planet, but. They want aggression, they want like this, a lot of microaggression, a lot of things that culturally I'm not used to. I'm used to somebody want to punch me in the face, they punch me in the face. I'm not used to the micro, like weird, like passive, like, I'm like, what the fuck do you want? What the fuck do you want to say? I'm not culturally, I'm not used to them. I grew up, you know, I grew up in the Bronx, you know what I mean? Culturally, somebody smacked your face off. Right. You know what I mean? You know, I got a problem with you, but. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or whatever. We talk it out. We talk it out aggressively. I'd rather aggression and I'd rather be upset and emotion and aggression come out with it just like smiling at you. You know, quietly. Mm -hmm. I'm a, so, yeah, so there's certain things, there's certain as filmmakers, unfortunately, 
our community doesn't have a lot of money, you know, to support, you know, to support an industry that's getting there, you know, but Mogan Island, you can blow up, so you can hire me, and I can make films with y'all. I ain't making no little boy. I ain't making no free films no more. Don't even call me. I'm telling you right now, I'm king of dope. Well, that's a, that's a good question. How would a new filmmaker uh, work with you? You did? Yes. I had other people who also spoke on my behalf, and I haven't forgotten you, Lord. No, I mean, I think at this point, be honest with you, a hundred times. Yeah, that's, that's the screenplay is phenomenal, and I just can't deny it. And um, I feel like the director. I meet the director, and there's just some kind of love affair right off the back, like kismet. And then I'll do it. You know, but that's a it's a suffer for me. You know, to me to not take a commercial or not go with some of my agent yeah. gives me and work on something that doesn't pay me. It's just say I'm a grown man. I'm not 28. I'm not 24 years old. I got real bills, you know what I mean? I got a girlfriend that wants to have a baby. You know what I'm saying? I got real life choices to make. You know what I'm saying? So I can't just be two months out of my life fucking around with nobody's films. Unless it's, I think, I really, unless I really think it has a chance to be a, a, a monumental success for myself and them. Otherwise, I can't do it. I mean, it's a reality that I think all of us face as independent artists living in New York City is that it's you know, yeah. our landlords don't take promises mm -hmm. for payment. I'll take the risk, though. Yeah. On something I think is, this is, I, I have a good instinct. Mm -hmm. So, if so my, 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 my gut is buzzing on something, I just call my agent. Like, I think I, I just have to do it. But I haven't, I haven't come across that yet. <laughs> So is it the same way, like, for instance, when you're working with actors, agents, they won't even give them the script, you know, if they feel like, is it the same type of uh, scenario for you and your agents, or they probably may not even give you the script if they feel like it's something that they can't get out of it in terms of a payday, et cetera? Me, my agent? Mm -hmm. My agent, no. I mean, my agent, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately with William Morris. William Morris is so big, I don't give a fuck about my little salary. So even my little salary, salary in the movie, they get like whatever. Laugh at that. Unless I'm Ralph Young or Megan, I'm making Star Wars. And they're not making no real check like that. They got so, so they got fucking Tom Cruise as their agent, as their client. So my little, so my agent really, I have a female agent, maybe that's something to do, but my agent really is like, she comes to my speech, to my presentations about the art of Young, and she'd be like, you know, your next thing, I'm really going to make sure it's tailored for you. She doesn't care. She didn't take money on. I have all kinds of gigs that don't go through her. She knows I got them. She's like, I don't need no money for that. So she, let, she wants to see me grow. So she knows eventually if I do, I guess she sees promising me. So she's saying, well, you have potential to make me good. You really be really good. I want you to be great. But maybe you will blow up and make some real money. But right now, you know, she's not. So she, oh, she's, I think for now, she's going to be really clear about what she sends me. She's not going to send me no. I may take a while for this. Gotcha. All right. I think it's the last questions. Yes. Um, you know, you mentioned that the first is not necessarily for a director to be consistent in the time of what kind of models of technical that you would make good average between the directors and the time. There's no technical knowledge. I don't think it's technical. It's just about having a, it's just about taste. And then the end of the day, and also, I mean, I think you should have directed something. I mean, at least a frame. You should have directed a music video or taken some pictures. Maybe you don't even take pictures. Maybe that's if I have to talk to you, you don't even take personal pictures. <laughs> I mean, at least something should be on your Instagram. I'm like, wow, this dude has a, you know, can see. He sees light and form. Something. But I'm just going to be like, I mean, I can't, I, I, I've learned that. You can't do that. What's next after Lord of, I mean, Lord of Dying Young is still in process? Is that, is that the next? Or is That's it? the next thing, hopefully. Well, Lord of Dying Young is, I've gotten a lot of, I picked up a lot, thank God. So, Lord of Dying, so I'm going to Idea Fest in Kentucky on Wednesday to present it. Um, uh, I'm presenting it. Uh, I just got a call today from Sundance that went to partner me with um, 
Michael Bay's company is interested in maybe coming on as a producer wow. for the project. We have a company called Cryworks. Um, Taiwan just gave me a, a ten thousand more dollars. Um, so I think the universe is pointing me towards our and I'm going to get that done. Mm -hmm. So cool. hopefully that will be done in the spring. You can come and see that. That's the goal. I haven't got another feature script yet. So we'll see what happens with that. So my cinematography career, I've been doing a lot of little commercial things here and there. Okay. But, so we'll see how that's going. We'll see how this picture thing goes. And hopefully I'll get my screen Okay. I'm just waiting. But in the meantime, try to eat. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.